RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sun Rays. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, life, general, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the tables. We now bring in Dave Palumbo. Before we do that, right now at rxmuscle.com and the Rx Muscle YouTube channel, part one of our three-part interview series with seven-time Mr. Olympia Phil Heath. And on that note, we bring in Dave Day. Finally, we got Phil Heath on the airwaves of rxmuscle.com. If you can give the viewers a little primer what they expect from part one. Yeah, you know, uh, obviously we had a little bit of a problem. You know, uh, I had reached out to Phil prior to the Olympia, and I wanted to get him on, and he had told us to send him questions. It was kind of a little standoffish. I sent him the questions, and then he didn't really get back to us. And then, you know, as I told the story, you know, he finally got back to me and said that, you know, something to the degree that he didn't feel the questions were relevant and that they were, he's got a very simple, too invasive, and and he wasn't doing the interview. Uh, whatever. We, we went through the Olympia, and then after the Olympia, when he lost, he did an interview, I think, the day after, and he said something to the degree that, hey, you know, um, you know, this, uh, the reason I didn't do Dave Palumbo's interview, he's just mad at me, and, uh, because I didn't do his interview, because, and I, and he went, he said, I thought the questions were inappropriate, and he should have asked me how it feels to win the Olympia, and then obviously, <laughs> I kind of went off on him a little bit, saying, you know, who, who cares what it feels like to win the Olympia? Of course it feels great. So, it kind of went back and forth a little bit, and, and I, you know, kind of said, explained, I did a whole rant on what a good interview entailed, and I think a lot of people get, you know, really responded favorably to that. Uh, kind of out of nowhere, there was another situation that arose, you know, with Phil, and I had reached out to him uh, to get his, uh, his point of view on it, because I felt it was appropriate to do that, and he called me, and he called me, and he said, uh, and we started talking, and I, and I said, you know, I don't understand why you didn't want to do the interview. And we kind of went through it. And I guess he got, he realized that maybe the tone was lost in the email. And when he talked to me on the phone, he kind of said, you know, I, I didn't really see what you were getting at with the, with the questions you're asking. And now I understand. So he said, I, I'll do your, I, I'll, let's do the show. So we, prog- we scheduled it for like uh, this week. And we sat down Tuesday and we did a, over an hour, probably an hour and 15 minute interview. Uh, we broke it into three parts. And I think it was one of his best interviews. And I'm not just saying that. He actually said it to me at the end of the interview, which I thought was, I didn't, expected to say that and he really was uh you know he thanked me a lot for the interview and he and he said you know this was the best interview he'd ever done and and he wanted to thank us for you know getting him on there and maybe uh, whatever we had to go through to make this happen was necessary you know because maybe it was a better interview because if we had done it before phil had lost maybe it would have been a different tone to the interview so i think people are going to really like it part one is up now uh we'll put part two up next week and probably part three at the end of next week so Enjoy it, guys. Hopefully, you know, you guys will get to see a a side of Phil Heath that no one's ever seen before. So, again, part one of a three-part interview series with Phil Heath right now at rxmuscle.com and the YouTube channel. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, what is the most AI you would suggest running into a show? Would you use a different amount off-season? You know, everyone's different. Everyone aromatizes differently. You know, I, I was a very low aromatizer, right? And I believe it has a lot to do with how much fat you have in your body. The less fat you have, the less you tend to aromatize. Um, uh, once again, I, I was never a big aromatizer, so I never really took more than a half a milligram of Arimidex every day leading up to a show. Most guys, most people I work with have to use at least a, uh, one milligram per day of Arimidex, or if they're using Femara, like five, you know, 2.5 to 5 milligrams a day. Or if they're using aromacin, they're usually around 25 milligrams per day. That's usually standard dose to keep your estrogen levels as low as possible. Now, if you're not on a lot of anabolics, then you might need to use less because you're not going to have as much drug that's going to aromatize. You're, the more drug you do, the more aromatase inhibitor you need to kind of inhibit it up to a certain point, of course. You don't want to take too much aromatase inhibitor because if you lower your estrogen too much, your androgen receptors are not receptive. And then you just you have trouble carving up and you get flat and you don't feel so good. So you gotta find that sweet spot. And if you're not sure what the sweet spot is, go for blood work and test your estrogen level. And that'll tell you right there if you're taking too much or too little. Let's go to the next question again on the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, Stan Efferding said in the interview, which was on live with about a month and a half ago, that oranges, and he put some parentheses fructose, and yogurt, in parentheses calcium, will boost metabolism. Can you explain? 
Yeah, I'm not, you know, Stan's, you know, vertical diet, you know, has, has, addresses food as a way for performance enhancement, you know, and, and recovery and muscle building, rather than supplements. Although he does agree that supplements make it easier. Um, I am not so, you know, keen on some of the ideas that he had. I like the fact of healthy eating and, and for healthy body type of thing. But I'm not, you know, I'm not really into this whole fructose loading thing for liver glycogen that he's into. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not really a big believer that calcium is that absorbable, you know, in the form of yogurt and, and certain foods. Uh, that's why I'm a big believer in supplementing with, you know, like a chelated form of calcium combined with the right amount of magnesium. Because if you don't have both, obviously you throw the balance of, of, of e either one of them off. So I don't really go along with that. Like I said, I wouldn't be eating a lot of dairy in my diet because most people don't digest dairy very well to try to get my calcium intake in. Um, once again, I'd rather supplement with that to make sure that I get what calcium I need. And then, you know, if I get some extra in my foods, then that's great. I was always a believer in trying to get your macros in, your protein, your fat, and your carbs from your food and getting your vitamins, minerals, and all the other good antioxidants from the supplements you take so you don't even have to worry about it. So if you, yeah, if you're eating foods that have a lot of these ingredients, you need them, great. But it's like your, your insurance policy is the vitamins and the supplements that you're taking. Let's go now to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not following us on Instagram, it is official underscore RX muscle. Let's go to good friend of the show, Jason Lowe, IFBB Pro, Jason Pro. Dave, what is your opinion on the, quote, three dozen eggs a day diet by Vince Gironda? He claimed a cycle of this large quantity of eggs could be as beneficial to muscle growth as steroids. <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far as to say that. But obviously, Vince was one of the first, you know, guys to really advocate a high-protein, higher-fat diet because he knew that protein and fat was what built muscle. And I've been saying this for years, you know. Um, I'm more of an advocate, you know, just from the, the, uh, from the studying that I did on what the makeup of muscle cells are. They're predominantly protein and they're surrounded by a fatty acid membrane. When you break this tissue down, you have to repair it. There's no carbohydrate components of it that need to be repaired. It's just muscle. It's just protein and fat, predominantly protein. So our diet should be very high in protein, moderate fat, and then the carbs are just a fuel source. And I've always said this. And I think whole eggs are a great source of fat because, you know, not only do we need essential fatty acids, but we also need some saturated fat in our diet. So egg yolks are great because they have the saturated fat. And then if you eat the omega-3 eggs like I advocate, not only do they have the saturates, but they also have good omega-3 fats in them. So it really becomes, it's, you know, the whole egg is really, the, it's not the egg white, it's the whole egg is really one of the most perfect foods you can eat for building muscle. You could probably eat eggs every single meal, whole eggs, and probably never eat another food and look just as good if not better. The problem is you, <laughs> there's a lot of sulfur in eggs. You'd stink everyone out of the house that you lived in because uh, you, you can't get gassy if you eat too many of them. So once again, I agree with him in the sense that those are, it's a great bodybuilding food. I don't agree that it's as effective as eating a, a, as a steroid cycle. Now, if he's saying that they're anabolic in the sense that when people eat whole eggs, they get better muscle growth, I'll go along with that. Add anabolics on top of that, and now you have the perfect storm, so to speak, of building muscle. Let's go to Yvonne. It's either Benjanic or Banyanic. I hate this show, yada, yada, yada. Can you tell us about the use uh, of fats in the carb of phase. Some people use them so the carbs would not be spent as energy. What do you say to that? Yeah, when I carb up, you know, I don't change my diet. You know, people always, sometimes I have people who complain that, you know, my diet doesn't change enough during, during the 16-week the, the, the dieting process. And I'm like, if I don't change your diet, that's a good thing. That means whatever we're doing is working. The people that I have to start revamping and taking food and changing diets and sending them new diets, those people are the people that get stuck for some reason their, their body's not responding. That's not a good you know, thing to do. Um, when I carb people up, one of the biggest mistakes I made in the past when I first started doing my ketogenic diet on myself and other people was I pulled the fat out and put the carbs in its place. And what I realized was that people, I got flatter and I couldn't figure out why, but then I figured it out. I'm like, if you take you know, 150 grams of, of fat out and you put 150 grams of carbs in, you've just decreased your calories by more than half because fat has double the calories per gram that, that carbs does. So that's a really silly move to make. So what I realized was that you gotta keep the fat in there because you want the fat to still be going to, to do all the bodily processes. You want the carbs to be used exclusively for fuel, I mean for, for glycogen loading. 
Remember, the last two days when you're carving, you're not working out. The reason you're not working out is you don't want to expend liver glycogen and muscle glycogen stores. You want to fill those up. So the carbs we want to be all used for, for storing as glycogen, the fat and protein will still be repairing and rebuilding muscle. Why are you repairing and rebuilding muscle on Thursday and Friday when you're not training? Because you've damaged it for, for, for the weeks before that. You're, you're still healing muscle. That's why you don't want to train. You want the muscles to heal up and be hard, dense, have good you know, definition in them. That comes from the healing process. If you're constantly breaking them down up until the day before the show, your muscles are not going to look their best. They're going to look their best two days after the show, which a lot of people notice. And that's because, once again, they don't take off enough time before a show. So, yes, when you carb up, you want to have protein, you want to have fat, and you want to have carbs. We get this question in a variety of ways. Stolen Duck 2, now that Flex Lewis is aiming to compete in the Mr. Olympia competition, not the 212 anymore, he specifically asks if you think he would have beaten Bonac in this particular lineup. But well, we've gotten a lot of questions as far as where you think Flex Lewis would have ended up this year had he competed in the Open. So I guess if you want to answer a variation of both. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to, for me to make a prediction because I have, I have to see Flex standing there. You know, William Bonac has got a lot more size than Flex Lewis. Flex Lewis's conditioning was better, but I think that uh, he might, you know, the way he looked at the 212 Olympia, okay, I'm not saying how he would have looked at had he done the Open. Let's, we're, we're taking his look at the 212 Olympia where he weighed 212. I think Bonac would have been too big for him, even though Flex might have been a little sharper. Um, having said that, if Flex could have come in the way he needed to, not sucking down to 212, maybe weighing 220, he might have beaten Bonac because Bonac was not in the best shape of his life. But once again, we haven't seen Flex Lewis in that Olympia lineup standing next to these guys that are gargantuan compared to him. So um, I think that's why he's going to probably take a year off because he wants to make sure he comes in at his best. I think, I think a 225-pound Flex Lewis will be very, very dangerous. I think any bigger than that, he's going to ruin his shape or, and or not be in shape, good enough for condition. I think lower than that is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think 225 ultimately will be a very, very dangerous look for him. Brooks Clark, Dave, how often did you get deep tissue massage and active release therapy during your bodybuilding career? So I guess if you want to answer that from your yeah. personal and generally what you recommend. Um, when I started getting massages, I, I think the first massage I got when I was going to hit 300 pounds because I was that's when I really started just being like beat up from, from being that heavy. And I started getting them once a week. I tried to do once a week. Sometimes I couldn't do it every week, but I tried to do once a week. It sucks because you don't want to pay the money. And I'm like, oh, it's such a waste of money, you know. But, but it feels so good. When you're that big and, and, and your, whole, your whole life surrounds around working out, that, that sports deep tissue massage really does help with recovery. And, you know, I would have done anything to optimize my workouts at that point in time. So I, 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 I went with pretty consistently weekly, probably for three, four or five years. Um, once I started getting into the years 2000 and on, I got a little more lax. Maybe I went every other week with it. But I still try to get the massages in uh, to help, you know, extend my career as a bodybuilder. Because, you know, obviously, as you get a little older, things get creaky. My shoulders were hurting a lot more. So I was trying to get, you know, anything I could possibly do. I was getting adjusted on a regular basis. Uh, I, I wish I was so diligent nowadays with the massages and the, and the adjustments. But uh, I think, it's, I think it's, if you could afford it, it's definitely a worthy tool. If you can't, maybe at least try to go once a month. Matt Tracy, would it be okay to take Testolize with Arimidex? Yeah, because they work by different mechanisms. You know, uh, Testolize will take, will bind actually estrogen and pull it out of the body. Whereas Arimidex actually just inhibits the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. So sometimes you don't, you miss some of the estrogen. Or if you have excessively high estrogen, you know, sometimes the uh, a product like Testolize will help once again, bind up that estrogen, pull it out. In women's body, it works really well because women, you can't inhibit the estrogen production. All you can do is block receptors and or the way Testolize works, bind it up and pull it out of the body. Uh, obviously, you know, taking Testolize also will reduce DHT levels so they're not excessive as well. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's a worthy product to use during that time. Most of the time I have my athletes and, and people who ask me use it off when they go off cycle uh, to make sure that we optimize levels. It raises testosterone, keeps DHT and estrogen a little lower. Um, helps with sex drive, prevents acne. A lot of guys who are on a cycle will use the Testolize to, to keep the acne at bay or hair loss at bay or even prostate irritation. Because not everyone has an enlarged prostate, but sometimes the, 
the high DHT levels will irritate your prostate and it causes irritation down there and that will drive people crazy because you want to pee every two minutes. So it will help in that regard too. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com. Again, right now at RxMuscle.com and the RxMuscle YouTube channel, part one of our three-part interview series with seven-time Mr. Olympia Phil Heath. Yes, that is correct. We finally did get Phil Heath on RX Muscle. We split it up into a three-part series. Part one, again, live right now at rxmuscle.com and the YouTube channel. Melon Fit. Dave, I loved your short interview with Big Rami at the Olympia. Seems like such a nice guy. The rumor is, or was, that he was leaving Kuwait. Now the rumor is that he's coming back to Kuwait. Do you have any update, and will you be getting him on live with anytime soon? Yeah, we had uh, we did a little update on Heavy Muscle Radio this past Monday. We would, Chris and I were discussing this, and it, it appears that he is staying in Kuwait now. I'm sure him and Bader probably sat down and, and, and figured out a game plan at this point. And, you know, look, it, the guy's making money there. I mean, he's, it's crazy for him to leave. Uh, I know Bader's probably giving him some money. I know he has opportunities there. Uh, he has all, everything he needs at his disposal, bodybuilding-wise there. Yeah, his family's not there, or at least the, you know, his big extended family's not there, but... I think for, for Rami, it's good to keep it in a, in a focused environment, you know, where at least there's a lot of guys that all they think about is bodybuilding, the Olympia, and, and training and, and posing and eating. Uh, it, it can't hurt him. He, and he, he's well established there. He has a lot of friends there. Everyone likes him. So it, it's probably smart for him to stay there, I, I think. You know, I think it would be foolish for him to leave at this point. Um, once again, you have to find a home base for yourself where you're comfortable. That is an environment that he's comfortable. Yeah, he's upset that he didn't do well at the Olympia, but you know what? It's not like he's got any major injuries. It's not like he's got a, a huge gut. He just has to work on getting in shape. And that could be definitely taken care of. I know we've been talking, it seems like we've been talking about this for five or six years now, and we probably have, but you know what? Stay in that environment, but find the right coach for yourself where you're going to be able to listen to them and you're going to get the best results. That, that's really what it amounts to. Now, I want to just make one announcement also, uh, yeah. for just a reminder. We have three, I think three or four spots left for my October 20th, that's Saturday, October 20th, um, diet Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru course that I give. It's my 10-hour seminar. I give it out here in Cape Coral, Florida, right in my, right in my uh, home office here. And it's a terrific course. It's a one-day, four years of college in one day, basically, seminar. Uh, I go over everything related to how to write diets, nutrition, supplementation, performance-enhancing drugs, all my protocols, pre-contest off-season for men, for women, beginners, intermediate, advanced people, detoxification. I answer all your questions. It's a, it's, a, it's a truly comprehensive course that I think if you're really serious about being a diet coach or you're serious about learning about how your body works and what supplements you should take and not take and which drugs you should take and, and how you combine them and, and do all that stuff, you're a fool not to take this. I, I can't tell you how many beginners took the course or and how many diet gurus that are out there right now actually came and took the course to make themselves better at what they do. Because you're going to learn the science of what goes on. And when you learn the science, that empowers you and gives you knowledge. And when you can impart that to your clients, guess what? You're going to be a better coach and you're going to get more referrals and you're going to make more money. So being a diet coach nowadays is a real professional. You can make over six figures a year easily if you, if you dedicate yourself to it. And you're really doing a disservice to yourself and to your clients if you don't learn the science of what's going on. You know, not everyone had the opportunity to go to college. You know, I went to college. I went to medical school. I have a very good background. I was able to apply it to all the practical knowledge I had. And, I, and I'm a very good teacher. So if you guys come here, you're going to leave here very, very, very happy. And you're going to feel like, hey, you know what? This was the best money I ever spent. And so, guys, if you go to DavePaloma.com, you can sign up. Don't wait because we only have three or four seats left. And once I only allow small classes because I want it to be a good learning environment for you guys. Uh, check it out. Guys, once again, if you're serious about it, come out of your comfort zone, sign up. I promise you won't be disappointed. Let's go to Bruce George. How do you even out your front delts if one is larger than the other due to shoulder impingement? Well, you do things, a lot of one-arm stuff, you know, so you're doing a lot of unilateral movements, you know, unilateral shoulder presses, side laterals. Once you start doing things together and one shoulder is, is hurting a little bit, the more, I guess you could say, the more dominant shoulder is going to work more, you, you're never going to catch it up. you got to do separate one-arm move, movements that move separately, unilateral type movements, you know. Um, and the reason for that, once again, is so that you ensure that each side gets worked equally. You might even want to do a couple extra sets just for this side 
at, or the weak side, whatever it is, at the end of your workout until it catches up. But once it catches up, be aware of that. You can do go back to doing your, your, your barbell type movements, but always try to do a few extra sets. Always focus on the weaker side whenever you're working out. Let's go to Spice Matthew. Pre-show dehydration. How late the day before would you stop taking water to dry out? And how would you adjust sodium on the last day before the show? I just want my first show, and I want to nail it in the finals coming up. Yeah, I've talked about this a lot of times before. I usually eliminate so added sodium. I don't whatever's in the food is naturally is fine. I don't. I take out added sodium if if the show's on a Saturday morning. Prejudging Friday, the whole Friday before, no added sodium. Usually around eight to nine o'clock that night, I'll add sodium back when I remove when I stop the person from drinking. So they stop drinking. I give them a, like usually sometimes I'll give them a, a like a like a almost like a cheat meal, like a, a burger and fries meal, which is obviously really salty, especially if you get it at McDonald's. <laughs> and if not, you know sometimes I'll just give them salt in a clean food meal if I don't think they need it, like a messy meal like that. Because I'm sometimes in people they're just barely in shape. Uh, I always add salt back to the diet the next day for for the uh, for the show itself. Because they're not really drinking, so you can eat, you know, you can salt your food all you want, and that's good because that balances electrolytes. So, you know, there's there's different methodologies, but th that's what I do. I, I don't remove salt till the, till that day before, and then I put it back that night and into the next day. And you really only need to stop drinking 12 to. You, I find that 14 hours before is usually perfect. So if you have a 10 a.m. pre-judging, by the time you're gonna get on stage, if you stop drinking 8 p.m. the night before, that seems to be pretty ideal. Let's go to T. Layman 21. When bulk is coming to an end, how long should you try and maintain weight before cutting to help keep the new muscle tissue? You know, some, you know, some people go right from a bulk right to a, a cutting side type deal. Usually when I'm doing an off-season muscle building program with people, you know, I'm pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. By the time we're ready for contest, they can't eat another morsel of food. They can't wait to start dieting. And so I just switch them right to the diet at that point. You know, all right, so maybe you'll lose a pound of muscle, you know, because it, it hasn't been, quote, solidified yet. But not if you're on a lot of gear and stuff like that. You're not going to lose anything, really, you know. As long as you're eating enough protein and enough fats in your diet, the essential fatty acids, which you don't really need that much of, you shouldn't lose muscle. B. Burton Fit. Mark Lobliner, said, Lobliner rather, says that if you train twice a day, you're training like a and that you shouldn't have enough energy to train it twice a day, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I'm not really a big low liner fan, but <laughs> I happen to agree with him in this sense. I, I think that twice a day is too much. I think that I, I tried it, and I only tried it a couple times, and I just always felt like, oh, man, i got to train again. It was like, it was like, it was a mentally fatiguing thing, almost as much as it was, it was physically fatiguing. I think it was a mental drain more. If you don't have the, the drive to go to the gym and work out as hard as you can, you're not going to get a good workout in. When you're constantly going to the gym, you just get burnt out on it, you know? And I just, my body's a slow, I'm a slow recoverer anyway, so for me to do two workouts a day, I, my body gets shot from it. Even if the second workout is a really small body part, it's just too much for me. And it doesn't matter if I nap two hours in between the workouts, it just never worked out. So I said, well, why am I, I don't, I don't do a million sets anyway. Why can't I just do both body parts, you know, that day? Now, I didn't train like that. I always did one body part at work, at workout, you know, one time a week, and I split my body into five, you know, body parts. But, I mean, if you really needed to do shoulders and, and, and triceps, why can't you get it done in an hour, an hour and ten minutes, you know, and get out of the gym? There should be no reason to have to go back a second time during the day. The only time I would ever do that is if I had to split my cardio. And maybe I did morning cardio, and then I did cardio after I weight trained. But other than that, I, I never did weights twice a day. Zorro5144, Dave, there are so many natural plant-based supplements coming out promising to recomposition and build muscle and stuff, so on and so forth. Is any of this true or any worth taking according to you? I don't know if you've addressed uh, the natural plant-based supplements that are out there. You know what? I've been hearing about these these herbal you know, type uh, ingredients that have been on the market for 30 years now. Adaptogens, they call them. They call them testosterone enhancing or, or anabolic, you know, turning on products. Ugh, nothing's ever panned out. I've never seen a supplement actually last more than six months on the market after a hype machine came out behind it. It's usually some kind of marketing machine behind the supplement. Gets people excited. 
oh my God, I could actually buy a natural supplement. I'm going to put muscle on. Oh, it makes sense. It's all, because a lot of the stuff on, on paper, you know, theoretically, it sounds like it should work, but in practicality, it just doesn't. Okay, uh, if it did, it would be it would be a prescription drug. Believe me, the FDA and the Food and Drug Administration, which is the Food and Drug Administration, is not allowing any uh, non-label drugs to be sold that actually do anything. Trust me on that. And as soon as they do find out that they're doing something, they pull it off the market. It happens all the time. Another question that we do get fairly often in different iterations. Michael Grafner, how do the bodybuilders of the late 80s and 90s uh, get in shape and achieve such great conditioning when guys these days can't seem to do so with more resources? I don't know if the more resources part has been brought up to you before, but yeah. your take on that. Yeah, I think people depend on drugs more to get them in shape now rather than actually hard work. What they don't realize is that what anabolic steroids and fat burners like clenbuterol and cytomel and growth hormone what these drugs enable you to do is, is train just as hard, okay, or if not harder, and get in better shape, okay, and still recover. So these, these drugs make the diet more effective. It doesn't mean you should train less hard. It doesn't mean you should diet less hard. They're not doing that for you. What they're doing is enabling you to get in even better condition, okay, giving the same amount of effort into the uh, fat loss process. So when I was using, you know, when I was a natural athlete, I trained just as hard as when I was a non-natural athlete. It, it's just that things worked better when I was on anabolics and, and, and fat burners, prescription fat burners and, and you know, growth hormone. It just made the, my work ethic more effective. Now, I don't know if this is a valid question, if something, an uh, observation you've made, but Krasi Gurginov, Dave, is there a scientific explanation why, and he says 95%, of bodybuilders have daughters. I would like to see mm -hmm. that, uh, so on and so forth. Is there any validity to that? And if so, what would you say is a scientific explanation yeah. behind that? You know, my, my wife Amanda and I were discussing this. I, I believe that guys who use anabolics and who get their girlfriends pregnant, and the reason, the reason why they mostly have women, is I think the female sperm are, are stronger than the males. Imagine that. <laughs> it's just, it's human nature, right? The females are always tougher. I think that the female sperm, from what I at least I've read and what I've seen, they're stronger, so they survive better. So when the male who's taking anabolics does, isn't producing optimal amounts of sperm, it seems like the, the male sperm are weaker and they just don't, they don't get the job done. Whereas the females, because there's more of them or there's, there's, they're stronger, they seem to be able to still get the job done. Because let's face it, when you get someone pregnant when you're on anabolics, it's a rare occurrence. I mean, it happens a lot, but not to a lot of people, okay? Uh, it just might be that they have a, a, you know, they got lucky, but the female s sperm cells seem to be able to swim better and they're, and they're just, they're just, they live longer. And I think so that, that's the reason why we're seeing that. Now, you know, when you take a guy like me who used anabolics for many years, but has been off them for so long, I kind of went back to a regular guy. So I got my son and I got a daughter. Um, and, and I think that's why that happened. And once again, it's the most unscientific theory. I'm just anecdotally giving you what I see. But I do see that most bodybuilders have girls. There are a few that have boys, but most of them have. Look at Ronnie. Doesn't Ronnie have like eight girls he had or something like that? Eight Olympia titles, eight, women, eight girls. So it happens. I don't know if that's the explanation. That's just my theory. Rob Nurland fit. Pretty philosophical one here. Um, your thoughts on competitors in this case he points out Phil Heath and Sean Rodin being told or strongly hinted after prejudging that they have basically won or lost. Um, I guess his question basically is the gesture that they're getting from the judges and how big of a mental factor do you think that will play with the minds of athletes? The great thing about bodybuilding is that it really doesn't, it doesn't matter what your mindset is once you're at the show already and you're posed already because your body speaks for itself. I, I, don't, I think that Phil just had a bad feeling, but you know, had Phil Heath come in and looked his best and his stomach been tight and he'd been controlling it on stage, he could have had all the bad feelings he wanted. They would have given him the title. The judges judge what's up there. When you don't feel good about what you really bring to the stage, you're of course you're going to have a feeling of uneasiness like, I think I might lose. Yeah, but well, you know what? You're thinking that because you know you're not your best. Uh, obviously, Phil knew he had some kind of an abdominal issue going on. He even said it on, in the interview when you guys listen. He's like, the, the sutures or the mesh broke on whatever he had going on in, in his uh, midsection that he had repaired, the, the umbilical hernia. 
So he wasn't feeling good about that anyway. So he felt like he was having to fake it. And then he sees a Sean Roden show up at his best. Of course, you're going to feel like you're not getting the love from everyone, you know, because you didn't, you, after prejudging, everyone had Sean Roden winning. So no one's going to come up to Phil and say, good job, Phil, you won. So of course, he's going to feel like that, you know. Also, likewise, you, you think Roden's going to feel like, hey, I, I, did the, I, I kicked this guy's ass. I, I think I got this. I mean, that's normal. Roden felt like that in 2015 when he beat Phil at the prejudging, or he should have at least. And he never won the show. Phil came back better and they gave it to Phil. And it turns out that Sean didn't even win prejudging. So, I mean, but that's just the way, that's just human nature. And of course you're going to feel. It's like, uh, you know, you, I see guys that they're, they, they line these guys up on, on stage. They put one guy in the middle. He's beaming. He's up there. He, his body looks amazing. And then they move him over two slots. And it's like, it's like his physique changed. He doesn't even look the same person anymore. It's like he's been, and that's because he's mentally been beaten now. He thinks, oh, they moved me out, they don't like me. And he feels rejected, and his body just, it just shrivels up. So it is what it is. There's definitely a psychological component to that. Uh, but I think that a lot of it has to do with, you know, how you perceive yourself going into the show. Simple question here. I'm not sure if you've addressed this one in the past, but Donnie is referring to clogged arteries. How would you go about unclogging a clogged artery? Right now, we don't really have any technology to do that. Supposedly, they're trying to build these nanobots that will go in there and like roto rooter and just kind of eat up all the uh, the plaque and everything like that. We don't have that now. What the best we can do is we can we put a what's called a stint in there, a stent in there. Uh, they feed it in through a catheter through your arteries. They find the place of the blockage. They they put it there. Then they expand the thing. What it does is it just opens up. And as it, it opens up, it, it pushes the clot to the side and it, it opens the vessel so the blood can flow better in it. And they just leave those stents in there. Uh, usually the people who have stents have to take some kind of a, an anticoagulant uh, or blood thinner, you know, for sometimes for life, sometimes it's only for a year or two. Uh, they have different protocols now. And that seems to be, you know, solve the problem, at least temporarily. Hopefully you don't build up a blockage in any other part of the artery. And, and that's, that's, that's where we're at scientific-wise right now. Last question from DRock87. It may not be bodybuilding related, but could the quote unquote biggest UFC fight in history this weekend, Conor McGregor versus Khabib Nurmagomedov, who do you got? You know what? I, I stop. I, I don't follow sports anymore. <laughs> I have to admit, I was a huge sports fan. I watched football, baseball, basketball, you know, basketball probably just the playoffs, but. I mean, my dad was a big sports fan. Even golf. We watched everything at my, at my house growing up. And you know what? Even I did it even into just maybe about five years ago. Once you get married, you have kids, you don't watch anything. You watch Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. I can sing all the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse songs. I can do the, uh, the Mickey. You'll find this out, Sid, very shortly. And uh, the Mickey Mouse Roads <laughs> to Racers. I know all the, the hot dog dance. That, that's what I know. <laughs> but, you know, obviously, I'm not a betting man. But if I was, I'd have to put my money on Conor McGregor. That is fact, actually. If you go through the RX Muscle YouTube channel in select playlists, <laughs> you will see an accidental Mickey Mouse or some Disney-related show <laughs> yeah. on our playlist. You know why? It is to that level. My son knows. My son can manipulate YouTube better than I can. He takes my computer or my phone and he goes through it, and somehow he must add videos to our playlist because he's always looking at the. When he's watching it, he's logged into the RX Muscle YouTube channel, so he's adding to the playlist. I, I, I noticed that. I'm always deleting these, these things. In the Olympia coverage, I think there was two Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, yes. videos in there. Mickey Mouse was on the Iron Road to the 2018 <laughs> Olympia. <laughs> that is going to do it for this episode of Ask Dave again. Right now at RxMuscle.com and the YouTube channel, part one of the three-part interview with seven-time Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath, right now at rxmuscle.com. For Dave Palumbo and our producer, Tyler Shore, I'm Sadiq Baruki. We'll see you next time.